Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Noah Rauch. I'm the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to tonight's program. It's the first of our winter-spring season. I also want to extend a special uh, welcome to our museum members and to those who are tuning in to our live web broadcast. Thank you to Apple Podcasts, Brillstein Entertainment Partners, and Smith House Strategy for your help in putting this program together. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Charlie Makish, former director of the World Trade Center, who's joining us uh, as well. <laughs> 30 years ago, terrorists detonated a bomb in the parking garage just below where we all sitting. The explosion killed six people and injured over a thousand others. And we honored those victims yesterday on the memorial as we do every year at the names of those individuals. John D. Giovanni, Robert Kirkpatrick, Stephen Knapp, William Macko, Wilfredo Mercado, and Monica Rodriguez Smith, who was pregnant and just on the cusp of her maternity leave. Tonight, we continue that commemoration, welcoming the host and producer of the new Apple original podcast, Operation Trade Bomb, as well as three individuals featured in that program. The podcast details the events surrounding the World Trade Center, the 93 bombing, with a special focus on Trade Bomb, the FBI's investigation into the attack. The series also explores the history of modern terrorism from Cairo in 1981 to 9-11. All nine episodes can be streamed on Apple Podcasts. Our guest this evening will give us a deeper insight into the attack and the subsequent investigation, as well as reflect on how the first attempt to bring down the Twin Towers changed our world. Mark Smerling is the creator and producer of Operation Trade Bomb. He's an Emmy Award winning and Academy Award nominated producer, writer, director, and cinematographer. A pioneer in true crime media, Mark made the landmark documentary Capturing the Freedmen's, which was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature and won 18 major international prizes. He co-wrote and produced the narrative feature All Good Things and produced the documentaries Catfish and The Jinx. Mark's first podcast series, Crime Town Providence, landed atop many 2017 podcast top 10 lists, including the New York Times and the Atlantic Monthly. Corey Cuneo was a 20-year veteran of the NYPD. Joining the department in 1986, Corey held various assignments, including patrol, narcotics module commander, sergeant, and lieutenant in the NYPD's press office, and two stints in the department's elite emergency services unit, both as a police officer and returning after 9-11 as a lieutenant. Corey responded to both World Trade Center attacks. He was one of the first to respond to the bombing in 1993, and after 9-11, he was assigned as late shift tour commander at Ground Zero, spending nine months here at that site. He retired from the NYPD in 2006, and currently works as the director of security at the Intrepid Museum. John Antisef joined the FBI in August 1987. In 1989, he was assigned to the FBI's NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force. Special Agent Antisef was the case agent on the 1990 murder of Rabbi Meir Kahani. After the 1993 bombing, he directed an asset who penetrated a second operational terror cell preparing to attack New York City landmarks. This case, known as Terror Stop, resulted in the prevention of major attacks. He was also the team leader for the initial response to the 1998 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. After 9-11, he was involved in the efforts to target and bring to justice members of al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. Antisef retired in 2015. He is a recipient of numerous awards from the FBI, from the CIA, and other organizations. He is also a member of the NYPD Honor Legion. Frank Pellegrino joined the FBI in September 1987, which makes you the newbie, Frank. Uh, a 30-year veteran of the Bureau's New York field office. He spent the bulk of his career investigating international terrorism cases after working in narcotics and counterintelligence. Pellegrino was involved at various levels in the investigation on the 93 bombing and the 1993, excuse me, 1995 Manila Air Bojinka investigation. He served as case agent for the fugitive investigation on Ramzi Youssef and later Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He also played a major role in the investigation of Osama bin Laden in 1996 and after 9-11, the investigation of the 2002 bombings in Bali, Indonesia, and he brought Al-Qaeda spokesman Suleiman Abu Ghaith to justice. We would like to thank every one of the, our speakers for their work and for sharing their time and their insights with us. 
Frank and John, it is wonderful to have you back. And without further ado, please join me uh, in welcoming our speakers in conversation with museum director, Cliff Channon. Thank you, Noah. Um, I too wanna to welcome everybody back for our season. Seeing a lot of familiar faces, wanna thank our members. If you're not a member, you have opportunity to go online and become a member, uh, supporting programs like this one. Yesterday, of course, we marked the 30th anniversary of the 1993 bombing. And uh, it was a very moving ceremony, I think. Um, something that shows time passes, but the memory does not fade. And uh, the power of this place and the memory of what happened here has driven three of the gentlemen, and now Mark Sperling, Sperling with his program, to go back into exactly what we faced and how we put the pieces together, even if unfortunately, some of those pieces were put together retrospectively. But Mark, let me start with you because this is built around the podcast that you've put together. Um, we are a place here which recognizes the importance of this event, but coming as you do from a somewhat outside perspective, at least initially, what brought you into the story, which I think you've said, has been certainly somewhat obscured in the popular mind by the 9-11 events. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I think that the, um, it was an exploration for me personally, because I was in New York for, in 93, I was in New York for 9-11. And, you know, I had read a lot about it, and I had seen other documentaries about it, and I still didn't fully understand it as well as I thought I, I could. Um, and if I didn't understand it, certainly my sons didn't understand it. There's a whole new generation of people. And then what was happening in Afghanistan, what was happening, you know, after 9-11, um, it just seemed like this is one story we cannot afford to, to forget. We needed to, you know, we needed to keep pushing the story out into the world and having new people listen to it. And, and, uh, and I knew that the gentleman at this, on this, on this stage here and other people we talked to would be the best people to put two feet on the ground and tell this story once again. And um, I learned so much just by going through the process of, of the interviews and the, listening to the tape and then putting it together. So there's so much more for me to learn being a New Yorker who lived through it. I'm sure there's a lot for, for younger generations to learn. It is a remarkable story and there are so many strands that come together through the different criminal investigations that wound up coming out of this. We'll talk about that, but I do want to take us back to the day because I think the scale of what actually happened has been lost as well. 20, uh, five years ago for the 25th anniversary of the bombing, we showed in the museum a model that the FBI had built for the trials, which in scale, of course, demonstrated just how deep that hole under the building was. And, Corey, you were one of the first of the first responders to arrive here. Um, I think you arrived still thinking that this might be a transformer explosion or something. What were your impressions when you got here? What did you see and what was the, the, the surround as people were desperately trying to get out of the building? Well, we first uh, pulled up, we came down West Street. We parked pretty much uh, almost directly in front of the garages, the subterranean garages uh, entrance. and. Um, you know, smoke, obviously, just poured out of there like crazy. Um, and yes, it was a, quite a while that we thought it was strictly a you know, transformer fire, a generator fire, which was how the call came into us. Uh, it wasn't until several hours later that uh, one of the bomb squad techs came over and said, no, it, this is explosion. This is a, you know, this is a bomb. You, um, you know, you were a story in the paper yesterday about the rescue that you and your partner uh, affected in that moment, you had to go into, I mean, we know this story from 9-11, we know this story from 93, the people who go in when everyone else is running out. So take us into that moment, what you saw, you were going into smoke that you really couldn't see anything, and yet you had the sense, I believe, that there was someone in there who needed help. Absolutely. You know, we got out of our vehicle, we started suiting up. Um, I was the relatively junior guy, uh, asked my partner, Eddie, said, look, you know, what are we doing? He said, Scott packs and let's grab some tools. Uh, about the same time as we're suiting up, Port Authority worker grabs us and says, hey, I hear screaming for help down in the parking garage. Um, somebody's trapped, you gotta go help them. So we did our equipment check, uh, 
Eddie's air tank was a little bit lower than full. And I said, what do you want to do? He said, oh, we're going in, man, we're going, that's it. Um, so we entered around Liberty Street and went down to the B2 level and uh, you know, did the check, the door was cold, opened the door and it was just, you couldn't see, like I said, six inches in front of you. We could hear the occasional yelling of the gentleman, uh, but yeah, you couldn't see a damn thing. So we decided at that, already decided, you know, here's what we're gonna do. He said, I'm gonna take the fire hose that's curled up in the, uh, in the cabinet down in the stairwell. He says, I'm gonna hold the hose with one hand, and I'm gonna hold your waist with the other hand, and let's just go out and grab this guy. And you did. Eventually, uh, we kind of ran out of hose. Um, <laughs> and I turned to Eddie, I said, what do you want to do? He looked at me, what do you want to do? I said, well, I think the guy's right here. I think he's only about 10, 12 feet in front of us. I said, I think we could just go out, grab him, do a 180 and go back, uh, find a hose and get out. And it didn't really work that way. But you did get him out and he... Yeah, we bounced around for a while. Um, you know, kind of got mixed misdirection, fell back on our training, um, you know, found a wall, followed the wall, uh, ran into one stairwell that was completely full of debris, so that was a no-go. Uh, kept following the wall, and then uh, the tank, the uh, air alarm on Eddie's air tank started to go off, starting to get low, and we were calling for a sergeant that had escorted us down to the B2 level, you know, this guy Marty Garvey, and uh, Eddie's voice went up an octave or two. And I'm thinking, oh boy, if Eddie's nervous, maybe I should be nervous. This is, you know, <laughs> this is not good. But um, eventually we heard, you know, voice calling back to us, we'll come to the light. And uh, obviously you couldn't see a light. So it was just navigating by sound, you know, voice a little to the left, a little to the right, keep yelling. And eventually, yeah, we did get out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, Frank, in terms of the FBI response to this, uh, you're there. As, a, as an agency soon, but at what point did this emerge as a bomb where now this becomes a matter for the FBI to be involved? I didn't think it take, took that long for to figure out that it was a, an actual bombing and not a transformer. Um, the police, of course, the NYPD bomb squad gets there first, but then our bomb squad and uh, the New York office is pretty ready, readily available. ATF was there at the same time. So within a few hours, uh, after doing some swabs and testing and seeing the magnitude of the explosion and you know, ripping through the B-2, 3, and up, you know, two floors down, three floors up, they knew it couldn't have been a transformer. And I think within about two or three hours, they had determined that it was uh, a device. Now, Frank, your sense of all this, uh, you're relatively, you're, you're working on these issues, but you're still relatively junior in all of this. Are you at the periphery of this, or are you brought in very quickly? Uh, no, I, I was working different stuff at the time. And uh, when this happened, they all uh, we were all told to stay in the office until it was figured out. And it was probably late in the afternoon when uh, Chuck Stern, who was actually on the squad that I was on, uh, was told to do an opening teletype, op opening a case, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a bombing case. Uh, so at that point, we were told 12 hours on, 12 hours off until it's figured out. The first indications that we had in the Bureau was that it was a Serbian matter. Mm. I mean, I remember John and I outside a Serbian restaurant in Manhattan for two nights. John would go in and start listening to conversations and come out. And uh, but then uh, obviously the, the finding of the, of the VIN number on the, on the van changed, changed everything. And that happened relatively quickly. Yeah, within a couple of days, I think. But the VIN number was found. Oh yeah, the VIN number was found about two, three days later by uh, well, you know, uh, NYPD bomb uh, tech, uh, Don Sadawi. You know, Mark, interesting in terms of you know, presenting this in the podcast, it's a very dramatic moment. And I mean, I'm curious as to your framing of it because I think you know, all of a sudden the key turns in the lock here and the story changes very, very dramatically. There'll be no more you know, Serbian dinners for Frank and John, they're going to be, they're going to be doing some other things now. Well, we had, we, we started with what Corey was talking about with the rescue of Tim Lang. And uh, for the reason you, you said, because, you know, it sort of illustrates the magnitude of what was going on in a really human way. But then we went back in time 
and we we went through the uh, the whole murder of Mayor Kahani, and then No Sair, and all that stuff, and we brought it back up to uh, the the explosion again, and in that time, <clears throat> we needed we just kind of mapped it out, you know, we just took it through all the twists and turns that were part of the investigation. Obviously, this one was one of the biggest parts. And what was, I think, what made it feel like that for you and probably other people is that John and Louis Napoli were tracking these bombers before this happened. So there was a catching up of the story. So there's an aha moment mm -hmm. where it all sort of comes into, into clear view. Now, John, you were working on related issues before the 93 bombing. Uh, but when we talked about this before, uh, you indicated, you know, in those pre-93 days, this was not especially a priority of the Bureau and the JTTF. There was, uh, there was organized crime. There was uh, counterintelligence on the Soviets and on the Russians. So there were other concerns, but you had already been digging into this matter. Yeah, we came across this matter kind of by luck. Back in those days in 1988-89, the JTTF was just two, two squads. It was an international squad and a domestic squad, and there were 10 detectives uh, on each squad and 10 agents on each squad. And I just spoke to the SAC from Counterterrorism tonight. It's up to 18 squads of over 400 people. Every three-letter agency in existence is there now. So our... Uh, you know, our footprint within the FBI was was pretty small. You know, my portfolio with my partner, Lou Napoli, was all the terrorist groups of North Africa, including uh, most of the Palestinian program. So basically, you're just kind of, you know, collecting data and stuff on all these different uh, terrorist, terrorist groups. But your early investigations all of a sudden rise to the surface when some of the names you'd been coming across before 93, right. begin to appear in the investigation yeah. of this. Now, I think just for the sake of clarity, it's important to say we mentioned before the vehicle identification number being found and that tracking back to the car rental uh, place where the van had been taken. Um, pick up that part of the story, if you would, in terms of what happens next, because that's really where, where the thing breaks. Yeah, when, uh, when they found the VIN number, uh, Lou, my partner, Lou Napoli, was working at the command post, and I was, to follow up what Frank was saying, I was actually at Kennedy Airport waiting for another plane that was coming in from uh, the Balkans to interview people, uh, if they had any knowledge of stuff. Anyway, my beeper, beepers back then, no, no phones. <laughs> my beepers are going off, you know, call, call the, the number, and it's 911 after it, 911. That means it's urgent. So I called the number, it's Louie at the... Uh, command post and he goes, forget the Serbs. He goes, it's ours. I go, what do you mean it's ours? He goes, John, they found the VIN number. <clears throat> we just ran it. It belongs to a rental agency and it's ours. <clears throat> I go, what do you mean it's ours? Well, it was rented by Mohammed Salome and uh, he used the address of uh, 36 Prospect Park Southwest, which was an address that we knew very well from the investigation of the murder of Rabbi Kahani. It belonged to the murderer, Nosir's uh, cousin. You know. So at that moment, he said, oh, you know, now I'm that agent who's, you know, was investigating something where the bomb went off. It's not a good feeling, you know. And I just remember getting so uh, upset and uh, trying to figure out, okay, if they went back to that address, this guy's got to be involved, this guy's got to be involved. So we did a pretty decent amount of intelligence work to figure that out, but it doesn't substitute for the prevention though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that does lead to the, the, the group being rounded up essentially, but um, the key person who was the lead of this, Ramzi Youssef, he's on a plane for Pakistan by the time a bomb, you know, a day later. Um, you know, Frank, you also were very involved in tracking him. Um, was his critical role in this clear from the beginning, or was it only later that the idea that he was the one to put this together became clear? Once people started getting arrested, and 
talking a little bit to the Bureau, they were all mentioning the one, this one guy named Rashid, whose name we really didn't know at the time. But it was clear that the way they were talking about him, he was the man who was behind it. He was the, the, the brains behind the operation. He was the one that was deciding what was needed to make the bomb and, and what to do with it. So it was, it was clear pretty early on that this person was the ringleader of, of this group that had already been established. It had come in a little bit late to the, to the party, but then uh, was kind of uh, running the show. And he was, but he was gone by then. Yeah, he left that night, which we didn't know. Uh, I, you know, myself, Brian Parr, Tom Kelly, we were assigned. Each pe person, as they got arrested, identified on the squad, people were assigned to work that person and work with the Southern District and try to put together, find what we could. The trial was going to happen. The trial, I think, started in September of 93. Could you imagine? I mean, yeah. seven months later, we had a trial. It's been 20 years since we picked up KSM. We don't have to go there. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we spent weekends and Fridays, you know, looking out windows of apartments, buildings at mosques, taking pictures to see if we could, you know, see who, uh, if he was there. And we did that for a little bit. And then I believe we found out when uh, somebody mentioned that he, that they believe he left that night. So, uh, you know, we ended up getting his, his real name from the, the Pakistani consulate because he had gotten a new passport. And, uh, and then we went back and checked the airline records and realized he left that night. Let me ask in terms of the trial, and, and Mark, this is a, you know, an important part, obviously, of the story and dramatizing this, and Gil Childers, who was the prosecutor, is here. And um, I think we lost Judge Duffy uh, to COVID a uh, number of, uh, last year, I believe it was, or the year before. Um, and you know, he was presiding over this trial and subsequent trials. Um, and I learned recently that he had had protection for years because of threats to his life because of the way he presided over the trial. Um, but, you know, that is really something that is the immediate focus. And I guess my question to the two of you in terms of putting the case together, um, I don't want to use the term slam dunk, it came to a later uh, problematic, but, you know, was this something that as you're building this case, it seems very clear cut that this is the nature of the problem, you've got the scope of it, and you've got the people who are involved, even if you don't have them all in custody? Or did it seem like there was more to this even by the time of the trial of the 93 bombers? I think we realized pretty quickly <coughs> that, that this was much bigger than this, just this. Um, but that being the case, the trial was scheduled and that had to be focused on. Um, now, our squad, the trade bomb squad, focused on that trial and those defendants Unfortunately, we had other squads like John still working on what was happening, also happening. But if you looked at the 93 bombing and then the, the terror stop case coming right after that, you know, it was really quite clear that this was going to be a, a bigger problem. You know, and then it, it proved to be as time went on. So, you know, as we picked people up and, and spoke to more people about what was happening, I think we... we realized pretty quickly this was this was going to be a, a problem. Yeah. Corey, I wanted to ask because, um, you know, this is a major terrorist attack in New York. Uh, the ESU in the police department is sort of the leading arm in going into these kinds of situations. What was the impact of the scale of this on how ESU saw its mission? And did that mission change substantially because of this and because of what now you had to contemplate as a possibility? You know, I think uh, it changed a little bit short term, though. Uh, you know, it kind of wore off after a while, uh, as opposed to, let's say, 9-11, where, uh, you know, the size of the unit was increased. Uh, types of assignments we took on were increased, the, the heavy armed patrols throughout the city, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, it increased shortly eh, for two, three months, maybe four months, and then it kind of tapered off again. I think we figured that this was more in the federal hands and, and our job was done. Uh, you know, maybe we were at the site maybe a month helping, you know, 
the FBI and the terrorist task force get into cars and open up cars for them. But then after that 30-day period, all work slowed down, and then five or six months later, the rest of the work slowed down. John, you were sort of picking up pieces of this, and I'm just wondering, you know, over time, you're really digging deeply into this. You see the scope of this, and yet, did you feel that the attention that this needed was drifting away, or was this something that remained a priority within the Bureau uh, as you know, you're know beginning to see just how wide this net goes? Well, to answer that question, I think that the attention was kind of drifting before it even happened. Because like I said, uh, there were so many other things going on in the FBI and you know, when we developed <clears throat> the source that penetrated the, the, the cell, um, you know, we wish that we had more, you know, attention to it. But um, after the 93 bombing, yes, there definitely was a pickup in the amount of resources that were uh, coming towards uh, the JTTF. I know that it expanded and we got more agents and, and more squads. But there was sort of a key figure here who we come to now, the blind Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, and his role as a preacher um, in the pre-93 days during the Soviet-Afghan war, you know, he was up stirring support for the cause and that was seen as fine at the time. But he was also developing uh, an ideology and a strategy that would target the United States. How does he emerge in relation to the 93 bombing? Yeah, well, the first connection that we made was <clears throat> after Nosir assassinated uh, Rabbi Maya Kahani. And by investigating Nosir, we found that Nosir was a follower of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. And we went through the search materials taken from Nosir's home. You really saw a, uh, a dedication to the, to the Sheikh and to the terrorist group, uh, al Ghamd Islamiyah. Uh, lots of uh, video recordings of the Sheikh giving uh, speeches. Uh, he had army manuals that were stolen from uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina by another person we identified, Ali Mohammed. Um, <clears throat> and we just saw another piece of evidence where they were planning to do an arm, armored car type robbery. So by seeing all these things so early, we said this could be you know, a problem that we needed to address. It just wasn't you know, one person having a problem with, let's say the leader of the J Jewish Defense League. Mm -hmm. We knew there would be more and there were, we also, came to learn about all the firearms training that was going on in the area, and people were going overseas to fight with the Mujahideen uh, in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Well, so let me all those things came to play. Sorry, let me. we have some clips from the podcast. I'd like to bring one in now. It's clip number three, where we are talking about the blind sheikh, and this is the uh, a reflection on his role in all of this. So I'll ask if we could play that. It's like something out of a movie to me, like, that the mob got involved in the second plot so quickly. And also I was scared in a way saying, how, how big is this problem in the United States? You know, is my guy the only guy that's hit two cells? Are there hundreds like this? I mean, it was like, it's happening too fast. So we have enough evidence on this cell. But then how do we get the blind shake? It's a little bit more difficult. Now, ultimately, you did get him. And Mark, you have a, it's an interesting turning point in the, in the podcast because, um, you know, that's the moment, I think, where sort of this narrow focus on one event, as terrible as it was, really expands very dramatically. And it becomes a much more complicated, more international story in many ways. Yeah, I guess so, because of where uh, Rockman had come from and his history in Egypt, he was and a spiritual leader for a terrorist group there, and he had sanctioned the assassination of Sadat. Um, and he had a huge following around the world. So, you know, Ahmad Salem had a large part in, uh, in, in the process of, of getting him convicted. Um, and at that moment, I think you realize that, um, for me, I, I realized that this problem is just not gonna go away because you know, we get Rockman or, or Abu Lima or Salome or even Ramsey Yusuf and eventually Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. This problem is 
is a much larger problem. And it, it comes from a lot of bad history between ourselves and, and entities in the Middle East, you know, and Israel and Palestine and mm -hmm. all that. So, you know, I think that's what opens up the podcast a little bit. So you start to understand these are, these are events that, that we're living with today because of events that took place long ago. Frank, you know, the, the story taking this international turn and um, I mean, you were traveling extensively well through these years and to the time we started working with you here at the museum, you're always somewhere very far away. Um, but uh, this internationalization of the threat is I think well represented by what became known as the Bojinka plot. And that all breaks in Asia. It doesn't break here in terms of investigations. Um, there's a computer found in Manila. Um, I'll let you pick up the story, but there is a clip we want to play. But I, I do want to point out that the computer that actually contained the details, which were so critical to this investigation, is down in the museum uh, in our exhibition downstairs as a loan from FBI DOJ. So, you know, we're very grateful for that. But it really makes, and it's a very old looking computer at this point, but it's a very, very tangible link to the fact that this was real and there were people working very hard on this. So let me play clip number four and then I'm gonna ask you about that um, part of the story. And then somewhere deep in the computer, it showed various flight schedules for various flights, what cities they're going through, the, the times they were going through, the layovers. It actually said Bojinka. And it was just a made up word by Yosef. It was not easy to understand the Bojinka plan uh, if you just look at the, the data that was taken from the laptop because it was a list of flights. And then what are all these flights about? They were supposed to put a bomb on a plane, get off, catch another flight, put another bomb on, and then take the next flight home. That also, the other voice was Alex Monteagudo, who was from the Philippine police. But um, that seems a real step in a direction that would come back to haunt us on 9-11, but also a more ambitious plot in some way. So take us a bit into the Bojinka plot and what that was and how serious it turned out to be. Yeah, we, we understood or believed that Yosef, after he left New York, was probably going to head back to back to uh, Pakistan. So our investigation had to go there. And we actually traveled twice in 93 to Pakistan. We thought we actually was gonna grab him one time and it didn't work out. Um, but then in January of 1995, there was a fire in an apartment in Manila with smoke conditions. Uh, the cops were called, firemen were called. They eventually realized that there was some bomb making material in the apartment. Now what, really brought it to their attention or, or made them really concerned about it as the Pope was traveling to the Philippines at that time. He was supposed to arrive shortly, a couple of days, and uh, where this apartment was, was was on the road that the Pope was going to take uh, on numerous occasions on his trip to Manila. So the Filipinos were very anxious about that. But the events went that night and they ended up picking up one guy his name was Abdul Murad, but when they picked him up, they didn't know what his name was. And, and uh, he started to claim that he was Ramzi Yosef. And some information was sent to us about the event in Manila and some of the details of what he was telling the police in the Philippines. So Neil Herman got an EC saying, this guy was arrested, what do you think? And I read it and the information was somewhat specific to 1993 bombing. There was stuff that this guy was telling the Filipinos that really wasn't in the press on the 1993 bombing. So I told Neil that, well, if it's not Yosef, it's somebody who knows Yosef. So at that point, I went to the Philippines and uh, we started looking at the evidence that they had there. And uh, it was clear from some of the stuff there, some of the ID cards, uh, that, that it was Yosef who wasn't in the Philippines. And although the Filipinos, because they were anxious about the Pope came, coming, they, they went into that computer a little bit recklessly. We were able to, to work around it when the trial came, but uh, 
the Bujika plot was found on the computer and we pretty quickly realized who was who because of where they were returning home. You know, one of the people who was listed as a bomber was supposed to return to Doha. And we, we had known that, that uh, Ramsey had an uncle who lived in Doha and ended up being KSM. Mm -hmm. So it really became, for me, an international <laughs> situation at that point. And this was a plot that was to set bombs on these planes, <laughs> get off the plane when it landed so the bomb would, would bow off at a subsequent a flight of the plane. Right. Um, you know, what's the back and forth then between the different parts of the investigation, between yours and John's, and the different sort of actors that you're bringing into this? John, how is, how is all of this playing out in relation to what you're doing at that point? Well, <clears throat> while they're doing the uh, stuff in the, in the Philippines, uh, New York office, now we've developed a whole different squad, you know, just to concentrate on, on you know, uh, stuff that's been going on with, with, with what's, what's about to become Al Qaeda maybe down the road, but we're also following uh, the players that are in New York, you know? And uh, if I can go back in time a little bit, you know, we, we were able to reconstitute the source of Mod Salem to go back into the, into the group and start keeping tabs on them. And as you know, we were able to arrest the blind sheikh and prevent another uh, five bombs from going off at the same time in New York, probably in uh, April or May of, of 93. But once the tear stop case was over and we arrested 12 people, including the blind shake, uh, there was still work to be done on the, uh, the other folks that were in New York. Like I said, how many plots are out there? What, what should we be doing to develop more sources to get a better handle on uh, what's going on in our territory? Mark, I think the, the podcast handles it very well, but it, it seems to have been challenging that you had to pull all these strands together yeah. with, you know, That's another <laughs> I try, um, you know, to bring, you know, all these pieces together in a way that is dramatic and coherent. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a, they did blow up a plane. Right. You know, Ramsey did put a, a bomb on a plane. Nobody knew it at the time, I don't think, but he had got onto a flight from Manila to Japan and he put a bomb on a plane, killed a killed a passenger and almost brought the plane down. So they were serious about doing this thing they were talking about doing. Um, and all these, all these plots are sort of overlapping and you know happening simultaneously. And we're jumping through time and jumping from one story to the next. Um, mostly how we keep it under control is we try to stick to the chronology. If you're gonna break the chronology, you know, you're doing it to illustrate something that like you were talking about, like this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and then you try to, we actually put a horizontal, horizontal chronology in a, in a room, in a, in a storytelling room. And, you know, all these, all the people are on the left and all the dates and events are across the top. And you can stand back and you can see how you weave it together to tell it in a truthful and honest way. You can't tell every piece of the story, right. you know. Right. Well, I mean, I, I'm going to summarize because we'll get to some questions as well, but from the audience, but you had the 93 bombing case, you had the terror stop case. Um, ultimately, Ramzi Youssef is captured in Pakistan and brought back and convicted. Um, but this issue keeps growing. You have the 1998 embassy bombings and John, I know you were involved in that. And so, you know, this is no longer local. This is now an international uh, I don't know how to characterize it, but an international threat coming from different directions at the United States, but not always necessarily in the United States. True. <clears throat> and, and so when you're going into the situation in the Africa bombings, for example, where does the puzzle of what happened back in New York fit in and how much bigger does it have to get? Well, <laughs> hitting the ground as the first group of agents to get into Africa and put out a call to the general public about cooperating with us and coming to talk to the FBI and the, and the uh, American investigators. Uh, <clears throat> my experience in working these matters going back from 88 all the way to 98 was instrumental in my uh, understanding of the concept. For example, <clears throat> we put out a call for, for help and then somebody who owned a hotel, 
said that a young Saudi boy had been there the night before the bombing, and then he left. He seemed to have been injured in the bombing, and now he's back. And now he's walking in circles, praying out loud to himself. He's highly agitated. So we got that information. Uh, I sent uh, two agents and a New York City detective who was on the JTTF to that hotel with uh, one uh, a Nairobi police officer. They arrested him and brought him back. I'm trying to make this short. <coughs> Since I was a team leader, I didn't do the initial interview. The other agents were doing the interview and they were asking him questions, how did you get hurt? And he had a, he had a story about why he got hurt. He said he was walking down the street when the bomb went off. And that was his story and he was sticking to it, but we knew that it wasn't true. So after about two or three days, I asked to, if I can just have a few minutes with them. And all the stuff that I learned investigating Nocer, the blind shake, all those things were at the front of my mind. And I just asked the guy, you know, did you get a chance to pray? And he says, yes, I did. Calm him down. And we talked about different uh, religious issues. I asked him if he knew a person named Abdul Azam, who was the founder of the Mujahideen. Oh, a great man, you know. Uh, I asked him if he knew Sayyid Qutb. Yes, he read all his book, you know, the book. Uh, so I knew that he was involved, you know. He had all the indicators. I, knew about Afghanistan, talking to Ahmad, talking to the people who used to go to Afghanistan, who fought in Afghanistan. I knew he was a veteran, like most of them at that time had been veterans of Afghanistan. I said, not, did you go to Afghanistan? I said, when you were in Afghanistan, where were you? And he said, well, he couldn't help himself. He was a young man, you know, he couldn't say it. He says, uh, yes, I was in Jalalabad, which was a big battle. And they lost, but they performed pretty good. And I said, were you brave? He said, yes, I was. And then I knew he was part of this, you know, information that we got that a guy fitting his description that just ran away from the bomb and it detonated. You know, it was two guys in the, in the, in the, in the bomb truck. So I asked him, I said to myself, this is the suicide bomber who survived. He has no exit strategy. And I figured he has to call somebody. So I said, like I talk now, very calm. I put a pencil in his hand, got a little loud. I said, write down the first number you called when you got back to the hotel. And he wrote down the what was later known as the uh, uh, Bin Laden Al-Qaeda switchboard. You know? <laughs> and from that number, by tracking that number right there that day, we knew that it was an Al-Qaeda uh, operation. So all the stuff I learned over the years did wind up helping me out in the pinch. Yeah. Just, just for the yeah, timeline, please. you know, you had 93, you had Tear Stop, you had Bujinka. Now after Bujinka, a lot of people don't realize Osama bin Laden was indicted before the embassy bombings. And KSM was indicted in 1996, long before 9-11. So bin Laden was known, at least to the Southern District of the New York office, um, there, there was a concern about bin Laden. And as, as things started to continue, uh, it became more apparent what was happening. And, and after bin Laden was indicted in 96, the embassy bombings happened, they superseded the indictment, and he was added to that, you know, that, that indictment was expanded. So, I mean, it was clear, it was growing, it was growing, it was growing. Yeah, no, there's no question that, you know, for those of you working on it, the intensity was growing as well and was becoming more and more powerful as a motivator. But, you know, Mark, in terms of telling the story, you know, where does the intensity of the investigation match with, you know, the relative lack of public knowledge or interest in all of this as it's happening and as behind the scenes events are building towards 9-11? Well, you, you can drop little hints because they were there in the real world. There was, you know, there was a conversation, I think, in the Murad interrogation about flying a plane into the CIA building. So you sort of, you take the pieces that now seem so obvious, but of course, who could, who could know it back then? But there were little pieces you could pepper through the story that existed in the, in the chronology that when you look back, you're like, oh, I see where this is going. So you're kind of pushing the story forward um, on a, just on what's happening in the investigations, but you're also giving little 
little you know Easter eggs along the way. Yep. But the me, most important thing is for people when they, because there's always a push to point fingers, and the, the, the key to not doing that is making sure you look at it through the events of, of 9-11. Right. You know, people, a lot of mistakes were done. Well, before 9-11, they didn't appear to be mistakes. Right, right. But just one more, it's sure. important also to realize that we're doing that in the story, but we're also trying to be sensitive to the fact that it's, 9-11 hasn't happened yet. Right, right. No. Right, so for, from the perspective of the investigators, I know that there was a lot of like finger pointing that goes around after something like this. But from my perspective, just reading the record, everybody was running as fast as they could to yeah, prevent no, it. It's a contemporaneous account as it's happening. Yeah. But let me get at the issue of the relationship between Ramzi Youssef and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed because there was a $600 or so that KSM gave for the 93 bombing, but that is sort of not really the main thrust of this. They are actually uh, uncle and nephew. Um, so Frank, would you pick a story up and, and bring us not just to the family relationship, but to the ideological relationship and the driver of these two very disparate events that ultimately converge? Yeah, they... Uh... KSM was Ramsey's maternal uncle, although they were about the same age. And although he did send $660 in November of 1992, um, he sent it to Salome's bank account, which Ramsey was using. Money is fungible. We really don't know what that was for. Um, but obviously, it could have been used for, for the bombing as well. So, I mean, we saw that money transfer. We didn't know who KSM was at the time. He was only college from Doha. That was the only information we had. But we started trying to do some work to figure out who it was. And eventually we figured out that it was his uncle uh, living in Gutter. And uh, so at that point, we showed some interest, but we had no evidence that he was involved. Um, then 1995 happens in Manila, and KSM is there in Manila. And KSM is, has had handled the computer that has the Bojenka plot on it, and he's part of that plan. Now, we know that when Ramsey left New York, he went back to Pakistan, and the word was that uh, he was kind of showing off his nephew, how proud he was of what Ramsey had done. And look what I can do now. Look what my nephew did. If you, if you support us, look what we can do. Um, but then Ramsey got picked up after the Manila plot. Uh, so, Yosef, uh, so KSM was kind of now trying to figure out <coughs> what was his next move. Mm -hmm. The whole family was bad. I mean, you know, make no mistake. I mean, the father was involved in stuff in, in they were from the Baluch, the, the Iranian side of Baluchistan, which encompasses Pakistan and Iran. And uh, the father was was bad. The, the, his two brothers were, were, were facilitators for Al Qaeda. I mean, they, they're, they're all bad guys. It was a bad family that caused a lot of problems. Um, but then, you know, KSM, got away. Uh, we, we were looking for him for a number of years, and, and uh, we had a lot going on trying to find him um, over the years. Um, but uh, eventually we, we didn't, and 9-11 happens, and then uh, yeah. he gets picked up in 2003. Let me ask about 9-11 itself, because uh, so many of you and you, Corey, were there in 93, and then your service on the site for all those months afterwards. Um, how did you, in learning about this, connect back to what those first experiences were in 93, and then everything that had happened subsequently in terms of not just trying to find who'd done the 93 bombing, but following all of these trails that by 2001 are not at their end. You haven't gotten all this sorted out. What was it to learn what 9-11 was and as it was happening? And let me start down at the end with Corey and then move to John and Frank. Your reaction to this event as it's unfolding here. Well, I think, you know, you sit back and you say, you know, again, as someone who's not totally involved in the investigation on the things, um, I remember thinking patience. Those guys had some patience. They waited. Uh, dedication almost, you know. And how many things were going on behind the scenes that I really had no idea what was going on. But you know, to think that it went from 93 to 2000 uh, to September 11th, it's just amazing, you know. And, and you know, you saw in your encounter here at the site, 
was the incredible difference in the scale of destruction of, from the 93 bombing to the 2001 attacks. I mean, that must have been overwhelming to be here all the time. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when I first got down here that afternoon, September 11th afternoon, um, you know, walking the streets, papers fluttering all over the place, the, that gray dust everywhere, it, uh, you know, towers are down, uh, building sevens down, um, damage to the rest of the structures. It was, you know, fire trucks, police trucks crushed all over the place. It was, yeah, it was Dante's Inferno. It was crazy. John? Yeah, for me, I left terrorism in 99. I wanted to try some old fashioned FBI work to clear my head with all this. I went to work out in the Brooklyn Queens office on uh, truck hijacking squad. Uh, but that day, on 9 11, uh, I'm a hostage negotiator, so I had a hostage negotiating meeting at uh, eight, about nine o'clock or so. Uh, I remember I parked my car, and by the time I got up to the, to the lobby, um, one guy, FBI agent, says, John, a plane hit the, the building. You know, I said, well, I, I just drove by it, you know, five minutes ago, coming out of the battery tunnel, made the right, one of the 26. So I start walking down Broadway to see what's going on. And people are running up, I'm walking down. But by the time I got into view, you know, after the Woolworth building, I saw the big hole, you know. And my first thought was, it's a big airliner hit it, and I thought of the Bojinka plot, you know, and I said, this is probably, uh, I bet you it's gonna be an Al Qaeda thing. And while I'm thinking that, because I'm a little north, I didn't see the plane coming in from the south, you know. And when that big flash comes out of it and the explosion, I didn't know it was a plane. My first reaction was, how did I get a device in the second building? I didn't even know it was a plane for a while. And then, then I, you know, when I found out it was a plane, I knew for sure that this was uh, an Al Qaeda attack. And we have a final clip I want to play. This describes Frank, you and Matt Bashir, who's a colleague of yours. Uh, this is from the podcast, uh, clip number six, and it really just capture the reaction of the two of you when you're learning. And you're in uh, Malaysia, I believe, when this happened. Yeah, I always seem to be away. I was in Malaysia. <laughs> I was in Malaysia in 1998 when the embassy bombings happened. I was in Egypt when the coal bombing happened. Uh, it was in Malaysia again when 9/11 happened. We've got to take your passport <laughs> away. I think. Um, <laughs> please play clip number six. <laughs> About a minute after that, my phone rings, and it was Frank calling me from Malaysia. And he was, Bash, look what they did to us. The first thing I thought was, because it was the Trade Center, you know, it was the airplanes crashing into the buildings. So I thought to myself, you know, who else would do this? You know, I remember calling Maddie, and I said, uh, it's gotta be, it's gotta be, and he, he thought so too. And I just sank down onto the floor. I was crying, Frank was crying. And we just knew. I just wanna say, uh, Maddie passed away in December of a heart attack. We worked together for six years. And it's nice to hear his voice. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're a long way from home. You've been following this for years now. And then, I mean, I hate to put it this way, but you know, this is what happened. It didn't. It didn't end. You didn't tie up the knot. Uh, not you. Not you alone. But all of the effort, and still, it happened. It's difficult. Yeah, it didn't didn't tie the knot. Um, hey, listen. Uh, I knew the name Hambali in 1995, and then he went on and does the Bali bombing in 2002. Right. So it seems. Uh, didn't tie that out a few times. Um, it's it's frustrating, um, but you know, as soon as it happened, we, like I said, I, it's the first thought that came into my mind. Although, just the size of the event, you knew it had to be Al Qaeda, and we had no information at that point that KSM was a member of Al Qaeda in any way. So, I kind of felt well, it's kind of silly of me to think that, but. Um, you know, then some information trickled out a little bit that made you think that it might have been him. But eventually, you know, we found out that it was. And uh, 
It's not a good feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we uh, can take a question or two from our audience here. Um, we have some mics, so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and wait for the mic to come if you have a question. Everybody's shy at the beginning. There, <laughs> right here, the, the pink shirt. Hang on for the, hang on for the mic. Right there. Thank you. Uh, first, Cliff, congratulations on becoming the president. Thank you, director. Uh, my question is about coordination issues. Obviously, when the 9-11 Commission was created subsequent to all this, uh, the issue of stovepipe came up in a sense. The FBI investigates in this way, and the CIA investigates in this way, and the rest. Upon reflection, uh, are there things that have been done now to lead to better coordination? Because as you say, for all the fine work that was done, the knot couldn't be tied. It's not to second guess after the fact. It's almost an impossible thing to guess all of these. But there was additional information within the government, uh, and the departments seem to be a bit of loggerheads with each other in putting the pieces together. Just, just so I could start it, that, that I, I want to make sure everybody understands that after 9-11, there seemed to be this coming from my own organization that the FBI is going to change now, that we're no longer going to prosecute terrorism, we're going to prevent terrorism from happening. And that always infuriated me because it looked like they were pointing their fingers at John and me because we were there before it happened and we didn't stop it. The job was always to prevent terrorism. I don't think Gil Childers ever would have said, don't prevent this from happening because we want to prosecute this. That was not going to happen. Um, so that needs to be understood. That was always our priority was to prevent it. But I also want to say things weren't as bad as they say it was before 9-11. And I'll tell you right now, they're not as good as they say they are now. Mm -hmm. There will always be loggerheads with the way we do things with the CIA. And that's fine. I think there's better communication. I think a lot of things were done to make it better. But you have to understand, too, stove piping is, is not good. We need to share. We need to communicate. But after right after 9-11, I mean, it was coming, the flow of information coming out. And it got to a point then that everybody was afraid not to do something with everything that came in. So now you, you know, thousands and thousands of leads. We couldn't do triage anymore. As a, a, me as a GS-13 FBI agent wasn't saying, well, I'll do this later, I'll do this now. Everything's being done now. So you kind of get buried in the nonsense too because you're not being able to focus because everything had to be taken care of. So listen, after 9-11, we learned a lot of lessons, a lot of improvements were made, and, and I can't imagine that they could get away with something to that level again. Yeah. But I think you also have to understand that you can have the best intentions by the director of the CIA, the director of the FBI saying we're gonna share everything, okay? And these are two huge, huge bureaucracies with thousands and thousands of good agents and good people and a lot of careerists, you know? so. You, you, that whole information flow could stovepipe because one mid-level manager wants to hold back a piece of information because he wants to do something with it to get a big, big thing going for glory. And I've seen that several times. And when they do things like that, the ripple effect there leads to missing, a, missing something to prevent the 9-11 or a 93 bombing. Other questions? Charlie, hang on one sec for a mic. Charlie Makish. Hi guys, uh, it's good to see some of you again. You know, I was the first witness in the trials. I don't know if this is on or it not. It is on, it is on. But um, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for the work that you did. And I want to share with the group um, something that happened the evening of the bombing, which um, shows the heroism of, of, of the Bureau and the ATF people that night. We gathered in a circle because we didn't really have a, a, a table to sit at. And there was Ray Kelly, the police commissioner. There was Fox, who was the head of the, of the, uh, of the region. 
There was myself, there was Stan Brezhnev, the executive director, the guy that was the head of PATH, and uh, Gene Fasulo, and, um, uh, who was the chief engineer of the Port Authority, along with Les Robinson, who was the structural engineer. And uh, we had moved from the Vista ballroom out because there was nothing supporting the floor of the Vista ballroom. There was nothing supporting the hotel other than stilts going up five stories. All of the lateral support had been blown away. And the first thing we tried to do was establish jurisdiction. It was Port Authority property. And I said uh, to Fox, I said, tell me what the federal jurisdiction is. He said, well, anything that was affected by the bomb. I said, that's the whole trade center. And I said, unless we limit it you, and you allow us to do what we need to do, you're going to have a hotel sitting in your crime scene, you know. So he said, okay. He said, let's just say that it's the belly of the crater at the moment. And I said, well, we need to get in there. We use spider scaffolding. He said, stay off the belly of the crater. Stay off that. We need to grid it. We need to photograph it. And we need to preserve the evidence it was the first thing that Fox said. And that's what we proceeded to do. But in the meantime, you guys were crawling around down there, you know, with the possibility of a hotel collapsing at any moment coming down. Uh, and that was, I think, heroic on the part of the Bureau uh, and the ATF guys, because it was ATF and the Bureau that were down there, and Port Authority cops who were in the uh, AirPAC as well. We established the jurisdiction as the entries to the Trade Center would be Port Authority and Ray Kelly would have the perimeter, uh, perimeter security around the Trade Center. So the city had the perimeter, Port Authority had the entry, and the FBI had the crime scene. And then you guys proceeded. You didn't, you didn't wait until we secured it. We actually, that weekend, used spider scaffolding and we used lateral steel supports that we got to shore that up. And, and uh, the next morning, um, when I met the governor, he, he thought it was a transformer explosion. He still thought that. And he said to me, you're the guy I'm going to fire. You can't even handle the transformer explosion. I said, governor, wait until you see what you see. You had the crater lit up like a baseball field with lights. And you had it gridded. And you were doing, you had already started sample taking material out and identifying where it came from. And that's why you found that VIN number as quickly as you did, because you jumped on it, notwithstanding the risk. And uh, I applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more. In the back there. Hey, good. My name is Andrew Colabella. My cousin was John D. Giovanni, who died in the 93 bombing. I've met a couple of your faces before. I don't know if you remember me, but I just wanted to say out loud, thank you for what you did, because it did bring closure to my dad and my mom, especially my family. Um, there was one comment that you made about not being able to tie the knot. We repeated history. We had 93, we were able to prevent in uh, Manila. You had the USS Cole, 9-11. And then it's been awfully quiet the last 20 years. And I compare terrorists to volcanoes. They lie dormant and then all of a sudden they erupt without any knowledge. For example, Al-Shabaab, uh, Samantha Goldthwait, she's the, they call her the white widow. She's been lying in lying dormant for the last decade or so. And it's sad to say that in today's society that we, a lot of people don't remember this event. But what I'm worried about is another event occurring. How do we know that there are individuals out there and we haven't tied that knot and something else could happen? Well, I mean, Rest assured, all the knots have not been tied. All the knots can never be tied. Um, I think, you know, everybody's working as hard as they can to make sure it doesn't happen again. I think we've learned a lot since 93 and on. 
uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. But you know, 9-11 doesn't have to happen again. I mean, that was a huge, huge event. What does it take? I mean, the Valley bombing, 200 people died. Um, the events don't have to be that big to be that bad. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the world is what it is. And, and unfortunately, I think in some way or another, whether it happened here or overseas, you're going to have some things happen. I, I really don't think they're 100% preventable, but we're trying, we're trying. Corey, I, I want to get you in on this because, you know, you have the police experience, but now you have the responsibility for an historic site, which could be a, an attractive target to somebody. We certainly have that here. Um, and, you know, we're very, very conscious of all of these issues. You know, how does it look to you today having the responsibility of protecting this historic site that you have? Well, you know, it's, uh, my philosophy is, uh, you know, I brought the NYPD in. They gave us a threat assessment. I went over it with some of the guys that are, maybe have a little more expertise than I did. And uh, one of our concerns always was opening of the museum. You know, we've got two, 300, 400 people out front, um, all in queues, all in lines. Uh, that particular time of day has always been my biggest concern, is that opening. And I make sure that come rain, snow, sleet, or whatever, that I'm out there every morning, you know, going through the line, taking a look, is anybody leaving a bag? Is anybody doing something silly? Um, so that's the way I address that. You know, with uh, small staff, we're not an armed staff, so it's a little bit difficult, but I make sure every morning I'm out front till that queue comes in and the two or 300 people are inside the museum where I can go back to my office and start some paperwork and feel a little bit relieved. Yeah. You have to say, just real quick, yeah. it's a reflection also on what what you all want the government to do, whether we can tie those knots or not. I mean, you know, we all have to decide what level of security we want mm -hmm. for our safety and compare that to what we want our freedom to be. And there's gonna be a balancing act. And I think that's always gonna be moving and changing depending on what's happening. I mean, if you want the government listening to all your phones and getting on your computer 24 seven, well, maybe we could stop all the acts from happening, but I don't want the government on my computer. So, I mean, you know, that's going to be something that's always happening. How are we measuring or, or, or leveling out our desire for safety and security and our desire for freedom? John, your sense of, you know, the threat and whether we've managed to reduce it to a manageable level or there's always something out there, as Frank said. But how do you assess where we are today as compared to where we were before 9-11? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Listen, I think that the U.S. government and all our allies around the world have really notched it up a tremendous amount. I think that if you're going to, you know, a cell of people that are more than two or three people trying to plot something and using telecommunications and dealing with, you know, actors overseas or into a known cell today, I think is a good chance that it would get at least picked up on a little bit, either by intelligence service here or one overseas. But that being said, you know, we have new and emerging problems and issues now. You have the, the whole concept of the self-radicalized individual who's going to be a lone wolf. You know, I can go out and purchase a can of gasoline and go on a subway, spray it around, light it up, and shut down this city in, in one act. And nobody would ever know how I planned it or, or, or what I did. One of the things I think about a lot <clears throat> in a response to, to even a major terrorism act is how we react to it and how the U.S. government reacts to it. I don't want to see the U.S. government fall into the plans of what the attack wanted to do. In other words, I believe that Al-Qaeda and the wanted us to leave a, a, our safe space in America and put troops on the ground in Afghanistan to have the same situation fighting the U.S. as they did the USSR. And if 9-11 and if and had been prevented, I'm 
pretty sure that they would have continued to pick at us, nip at our heels, until they got that for us to do that. Put troops on the ground over there and fight us the old-fashioned way that they dream about with, you know, Mujahideen and glory and stuff like that. So one of the best ways to handle terrorism is how we, we react. And 19 guys, I think of a lever. They had a million-mile lever. 19 guys changed the, you know, were able to shift the whole planet, you know. And that's all I have to say. Yeah. Mark, last word for you. The, the podcast really does capture, you know, this pivotal moment. And of course, we know from written retrospect where it's leading to in 9-11. In but, you know, the 93 bombing really was the opening of this chapter, at least as the world saw it. And yet the ambiguity of the world seeing it, but not really focusing on it. I think it, it, it sort of haunts the whole, the whole program that you put together. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I would hope that people would come away from the podcast thinking about more broadly about who we are as American and America in the world. You know, I mean, we can all point our fingers at CIA or the FBI or we could have done this or we should have been over here. But the reality is the things that are causing these events are still happening in the world. I mean, what's happening in Israel right now is as bad or worse than it was when, when KSM and, and Ramsey were growing up in Kuwait. You know, what's happening in Afghanistan right now is obviously worse, you know, and we have to look towards our government to kind of think about where we are in those conflicts and how the backlash of where we are in those conflicts eventually come home to roost. That's, I mean, it's not spoken outwardly in the podcast, but I think it's in the context of, of what the events were and how history looks upon them. We're going to stop it there. Um, I refer you to Operation Trade Bomb, the podcast on Apple Plus. Um, and please join me in thanking Mark Swirling, Corey Cuneo, John Aniston, and Frank Pellegrino.